talk about some of your stories of the um, um, the depression, because that had a big influence. Well, you know, the depression years when I saw the unemployed and the veterans marching for the bonus and they go out to throwing tear gas at them, that didn't look good to me at all. No. So yeah. It turned me against the country I was brought up in. It turned me against the leaders. But I met a lot of wonderful people that said, if only we had decent people in government. You can't have that because there are lobbies in Washington that want you to represent the drug industry or the aircraft industry, and they pay off senators, pay them to help them get elected. And you have to take care of them when you get elected. Do you understand? Yeah. People put up money for people running for political office. And if the certain lobbies, you either represent them or you'll never get elected. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would like you to tell how you came to think that the system should be changed and uh, why Marxism oh, good, wouldn't good. be sufficient. Because during the Depression, there were people sleeping in every empty lot. There were people up on soapboxes. That's where they came from. Talking about mankind united, and that, or that all people ought to join together and work toward a good life. But there was no detail. So I walked away, and there's another guy on the about socialism. The working class is being exploited by industry. That made sense. But he had no, how do you do that? There's no answer. So another guy on the soapbox, communist. So I was standing there and he says, beat it, youngster. I was just a kid. So I said, no, I want to stay here. So he says, why? I says, I want to hear what communism is from a communist. Because I don't believe what our government says, what the Republicans say about the Democrats, what the Democrats say about the Republicans, they all lie about each other. I'm sure you know that. Well, I knew that then. And I said, I want to hear your idea of communism for myself, not an interpretation. So he says, you can stay. And so after one hour, I said, I want to ask you a thousand questions. Then he said, you have to go to the YCL, Young Communist League. He gave me an address, I went there. And I, the kids were smart and well-read. They were good. And I stood there and I said to them, if you get into power, how will you prevent corruption from some of the... Con you guys may be all right, honest and everything, but how will you prevent corruption? I really wanted to know. They said, when that time comes, we'll work on it. I said, all right, how are you going to house the masses of people? Well, we'll worry about that when that time comes. I said, let's start a technical branch of the Communist Party and work out how to prevent corruption and mass housing. Mm -hmm. So they said, you're deviationist. I didn't know what the word meant. They said, you're deviating from the teachings of Marx. I said, no, I'm trying to help you. <laughs> he was a dope, the guy that ran the group. I don't say that's typical of all communists, but this guy was a jerk. He said, you're not sticking with Marx or Engels or any. So I said, I'm trying to help because you're trying to make a better world. I'm trying to prevent corruption and trying to build up a way of getting there. <coughs> so he says, you'll have to leave. But the vice president of the Young Communist Party was about 17 years old. He said, let's hear him out. So they said, both of you have to leave. And they kicked us both out. So that was my experience with the Young Communist League. So I left. So, yes. I don't think you ever finished with technocracy, did you? you got yes, I did. I told them all about how I went into okay. it, joined, and why I resigned. Because of the blacks, I did. and they, I might have gotten the yeah. phone. Okay. I did. I mean, yeah. no, you didn't yeah. hear that. No. <coughs> but anyway, technocracy is not a bad organization. It just says those certain things. If they can't be revised, I can't support it. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so when the guy says, you sound like a technocrat, I do believe in science and government. <clears throat> the methods of science, not scientists, because they're just as bigoted and prejudiced as anyone else. Don't think because the person's a scientist. He's open-minded. Scientists used to write books on why man can't get to the moon. <clears throat> Goddard, you know who Goddard is? The American rocket scientist. <clears throat> Goddard. 
he worked on rockets in America. And he said, he was a scientist, he said, whenever I go to science conferences, I'm not to talk about rockets. But he said, then that puts you in the category of a dreamer. He wrote that in his book. So he says he couldn't talk about rockets, even the scientists, because it was so bigoted and prejudiced. So scientists are not always scientific. If a person were a scientist, he, you know the guy in the wheelchair that's very scientific, that talks of particle behavior? Hawkins, oh, yeah. Hawkins. Hawkins, yeah. Oh, right. If he were a scientist, he'd look at the society first and say, hey, wait a while, we go to war, we kill each other. He'd wonder why we go to war. Who the hell gives a shit about particles behavior while the world is falling apart? There are scientists today that work on heart disease and kidneys and all. I used to design medical equipment, artificial hips and all that, until I found out that a guy that had no legs couldn't afford to buy the stuff I designed. So what the hell good is it? Only people that can afford that kind of surgery can get it. So I said, what the hell are you wasting your time for? Then I met with alcoholics and drug addicts and I helped them out of it. But